happy Glacier Science Day. Thanks for joining us today. I'm back in Two Medicine, beautiful Two Medicine, on a gorgeous September day. Ranger Melissa stands in a lush area in front of some rocky cliffs on a sunny day. So gonna be about 70 degrees over here today. Behind me, I've got rocky cliffs because we're gonna talk about a species that likes to make their home there, the bighorn sheep. We're gonna meet up with research ecologist, Dr. Tabitha Grace from the United States Geological Survey and Dr. Elizabeth Flesh, who's from the Montana from Montana State University, where she's a postdoctoral researcher. So let's go find Tabitha and see a little bit more if we can find these bighorn sheep and learn more about them. So come on, let's go. Tabitha holds binoculars to her eyes, looking up at the cliffs. Oh, Tabitha, there you are. How are you today? I see you're looking at something. What do you have in, in your binoculars? Are you seeing some sheep today? I am, yeah. There's some bighorn sheep up there in the cliffs. Oh, my and, gosh. And, yeah, pretty big group of them. There's some uh, ewes with some no lambs. Way. A group of bighorn sheep grazes on the cliffside. A map shows Upper Montana and the Canadian border. There are two dark splotches near the top left of the map near the Text Glacier National Park in Montana and Waterton Lakes National Park in Canada. Text, map from Dr. Elizabeth Flesh. Dark shaded areas show native populations of bighorn sheep. This group of bighorns is unique because it's one of only two large native meta populations that have never uh, gone extinct locally. Um, and they also have never had other bighorn sheep brought into them. And so oh. they basically have been around um, for a really, really long like time. Th like thousands of Probably years? Probably thousands of years, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. What a cool thing to have here in this park. So I want to know more about your research. What are you studying and what are you trying to find out about bighorn populations here? We are interested in all kinds of things. So we were looking at the habitat selection. So why are they in some places versus other places? We sweep um, across a mountainous area with dense coniferous trees. We're interested in the movement. And um, for that, there's kind of two things that we're trying to that we're interested in. On the one hand, if you have connected populations that move and interchange, it basically means there's a larger population size. And so that can be more robust to different things that happen. Two bighorn um, sheep trapes across a snowy landscape. Text, footage courtesy Dr. Elizabeth Flesh. And then for bighorn sheep, one of the current threats that's really a big deal is uh, respiratory pneumonia. Oh. And yeah, so it's a respiratory, there's a respiratory disease and it can actually kill off a large portion of the herd. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, and so the movement is important because being a meta population, so there's multiple small populations, we think. Okay. That means that those places where they might move between each other are also, and, and swap places with each other are also places where the disease might be able to be transmitted. Ah, uh -huh. disease hubs. Bighorn sheep graze and lounge in a green area. Yeah, exactly. How do you know where the bighorn sheep are going? Well, I brought uh, something to show you, actually. Okay, cool. So this is a GPS collar, and it's got uh, a couple different uh, parts on it. And so this big part down here is the battery pack, and that's what lets it run for the whole year and or more that we have it out on the Bighorn Sheep. Dabitha holds an off-white GPS collar with a large battery pack attached. She demonstrates how the black clasping mechanism can release. This is an antenna on this part and up at the top, and that's what lets it to lets it get the satellite signal, um, so it can record a GPS location. And then we have a little um, uh, cloth part that can eventually wear through, or we have a remote um, uh, release that will let the collar fall off when we have it programmed to. So it just goes pop and then um, it drops off and then we can go and get the collar. But most of the time we're able to retrieve them. So we got wow. 95 of our 100 collars <gasps> 95 back. 95 out of 100? That's amazing. A sheep with short horns wears a GPS collar. Text, photo courtesy Dr. Elizabeth Flesh. Yeah, it's a, an incredible resource. So we have over 168,000 locations oh my gosh. Um, across those 95 different sheep. Wow, there's so much to learn, but it looks like just tracking them and exploring where they go and their habitat is really helping. Yeah, I mean, it tells us which areas are important for them, for one thing, but then it also lets us start to get at questions about um, how those areas might be changing over time with climate change and fire. The group of sheep on the cliffside travels up the cliff. 
one of the cool things about the GPS collar data is it can show us the places where they do tend to use more often. And one of those places that's really interesting is mineral licks. A sheep licks the rocky ground. Text, remote camera trap photo. USGS remember to stay at least 25 yards from all bighorn sheep. So these mineral licks uh, are needed by the sheep for the resources they have for their horns and their bones and their okay. teeth, all those things. Wow. And um, they're in Glacier Park, it's really rare, a lot of these minerals. And so they'll go um, as far as 30 kilometers to these wow. mineral licks. Photos show different sheep utilizing mineral licks. A young bighorn sheep follows a larger one wearing a GPS collar. Text, photo courtesy Dr. Elizabeth Flesh. Two sheep with large horns but heads. The GPS collar data gives us this really fine scale information about like a location every few hours about how the bighorn sheep are moving across the landscape, whether it's to these mineral licks mm. or to the la their lambing areas or their rutting areas. We're going to pair that with the genetic data which okay. tells us more about long-term movements and how gene mm. flows between different parts of the population. Oh, wow. So that would be a lot longer term because yeah. you're looking at how genes uh, for many different generations, right? Like yeah. move across these populations. Exactly. So you get, you know, a single individual will carry their gene somewhere. And then if they have offspring, it gets more diffuse in that part of the population. And to learn more about that, we get to meet with Dr. Elizabeth Flesh from Montana State University. Is that right? Yeah, we've been working together a long time and I think you'll really enjoy talking to her. Okay, great. So uh, we'll hopefully meet up with her soon and find out more. Ranger Melissa and Dr. Flesh stand in front of concrete steps up to a building entrance. Elizabeth, oh my gosh, thank you so much for meeting us today. We've heard all about your work from Tabitha. I'm so excited to learn more about the genetics that you're doing with bighorn sheep. Are you going to show us some cool stuff today? Yeah, let's head on in the office and I'll show you. Okay, awesome. Let's go. Yeah, so effectively to learn about genetics, of course, we have to get samples from the bighorn sheep themselves. And so uh, we capture them and then collect those samples using these tools that I have here. Ranger um, Melissa and Dr. Flesh sit at a conference table. A photo shows a person holding a syringe next to a bighorn sheep wearing a blinder. So for oh, example, okay. uh, this tube here is what you can put blood inside. Or we can also put the blood on what's called a FTA classic card or a gene card. And so essentially what you do is just put spots of blood on these little circles here and then dry it out in the air. Dr. Flesh holds a vial with a purple lid. She holds a gene card and waves it through the air. And then after that you can just store it at room temperature and then take no little way. Yeah, and then you take little punches from the blood spots that are here in the lab and then you can extract DNA from that as well. Oh my gosh. Okay, that is something I did not know. Man, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's really nice because you don't have to worry about freezer storage like you do with the Up close, the card is printed with four large circles. Text above three horizontal lines on the card reads, place barcode here. So we can also take tissue samples. So typically when we catch bighorn sheep, we put a little ear tag in their ear so we can uniquely identify them later. And so what we can do is like getting your ear pierced, we can just take a little punch of the tissue before uh, we put the ear tag in and then place it in this vial with ethanol and then freeze that and we can extract DNA from that as well. Wow, that is so cool. The bighorn sheep wearing a blinder has an ear tag. A man grips one of its horns with gloves. Another person holds a syringe. Text, photo courtesy Dr. Elizabeth Flesh. Dr. Flesh holds a small vial with an orange cap. As you probably know, genetic diversity is really important for the potential for a population to add up to future changing conditions such as environmental changes or uh, changes in disease that they might be exposed to. So if you have more diversity in a population, there's more of a chance that you have some individuals that might survive a new threat because they have different genetics than some others that might not be able to. So we're also looking at how different populations are related to one another and so that's why I have this graphic up here oh. that we use to actually compare the glacier population with other populations in oh, Montana. Oh, this is a graphic showing a section of Montana. So I'm showing you a map of bighorn sheep population and so we've got 
Western Montana shown here, Glacier is way up at the top. And each of these colors is showing a different genetic line of bighorn sheep populations. And so if a population has the same color, it means that they have a similar genetic line or are related to one another. A map shows different Montana bighorn sheep populations in color-coded spots, with arrows connecting different spots with each other. Most of the spots shown are green or part green, and green arrows flow to many other spots. The two spots near Glacier National Park are mostly yellow. One has a green sliver and one has an orange section. Arrows don't connect them with any other spots. Text, Map Source, Flesh EP, Graves DA, Thompson JM et al. Evaluating Wildlife Translocations Using Genomics, a Bighorn Sheep Case Study. Eco Evil. 2020, 10136871370 population is actually really unique because it's a what we call a native population meaning that it was never extirpated in the history well, they, of, they, it never died out yes exactly okay, okay. Um, in the history of uh, Western expansion across North America and so wow so that glacier population is special because it's never it's all it's been here for thousands of years exactly wow. dr. flesh stands next to a screen displaying the sheep population map yeah it's only one of two large bighorn sheep populations in Montana where that's the case. So oh it's really gosh. special. Wow. Of course, the genetics shows long-term movement of breeders, but we can look at the movement data to see how bighorn sheep use the landscape in real time and better understand how smaller groups of sheep are connected to try and understand how respiratory disease might through, move through a population and how they're connected on a geographic scale. Wow, I just have learned a ton uh, today about just how um, important it is when you take a look at a population, a wildlife population, how many intricate details it takes to understand not only their kind of their health and how they're doing, but just where they live, how they move across the landscape, um, who they're related to, how that might impact the whole population as a whole. And that's just really amazing to see all that in the work that you're doing. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for coming by today and taking time to talk to us about the genetics that relate to this bighorn sheep study. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to kind of learn more and see how some of the information you're collecting will um, help with management decisions in the future here at Glacier National Park. So thank you for coming today. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Ranger Melissa stands next to Tabitha near the Rocky Cliffs. We have learned so much about how you are tracking bighorn sheep movement across the landscape and then um, finding out how they are connected or not connected with these different subgroups looking at the genetics. But I'm just wondering, is there anything that we could do to kind of keep these populations safe and intact? People release a bighorn sheep in a snowy landscape. It runs off. A bighorn sheep walks down a snowy hill to join three others. Text. Video courtesy Dr. Elizabeth Flesh. Yeah, we hope that our research will provide managers a lot of options. So USGS is a science agency, and so we're, we do the research, and then um, we try to present that and share that with our park partners so that they can make decisions that are informed by that science. So um, some of the things that we think will be important that will come out um, are, first of all, just identifying the places that are really important for the bighorns. But then if these changes are happening, um, we can first, you know, we can look at like how is it changing and how does that fit into the bighorn ecology. So okay. we know that they need open meadows. And so if there's mm -hmm. particular places where, let's say, shrubs or trees are starting to encroach in those meadows, that gives managers a potential option to think about maybe there's a few of those that might be worth mechanically cutting. Okay. Two bighorn sheep graze on a ridge while an elk stands on the other side of the ridge. Text, video courtesy Dr. Elizabeth Flesh. It might be that uh, invasive weeds might be degrading some places, and that might be something that, that could be yeah. treated. Um, and then in terms of the movement, which I think was your original question, um, there could be things like um, forests that are acting as barriers and a big forest fire comes through and managers could decide whether or not that's something important enough to try to protect as a resource. From so, above, bighorn sheep walk across snow. Text, video courtesy Dr. Elizabeth Flesh. Trees dot a mountainous landscape. So there's a really a wide array of things that, that could be, uh, that have um, management potential. 
Thanks so much for joining us, Tabitha. We had such fun and learned a great deal. So I want everyone at home, thank you so much also for joining us, but also to know that this is our last Glacier Science video of season two. So thanks for sticking with us all summer long. I hope that there'll be another season next year. So keep on your radar for looking at our social media feeds. But for now, have a happy Glacier Science Day. See you next year. Bye. Text. This research was made possible through funding from the Glacier National Park Conservancy, U.S. Geological Survey.